Beastars is one of the best CGI anime in existence, a fact we know to be true because Studio Orange produced it. While personally I don't think that it excelled to the same heights as Orange's previous work, Land of the Lustrous, I think that's more of a, a preference of aesthetics rather than a judgement on the skill of their animators. There definitely is an increase in skill and prowess as the studio continues to adapt manga into these beautiful 3D set pieces, even if this time around all of the things that they took from Lustrous was perhaps more lust than we bargained for. Beastars asks questions that our culture sometimes fears to put a spotlight on. What exactly is humanity? This is not a direct question that the show asks, but rather one that is a bit more subtle in its questioning. How can we showcase the plight of humanity? better than casting a set of characters with no humanity at all. Anthropomorphic beasts with bloodlust and instincts, unchained from our expectations of human civility and decorum, yet at the same time standing upright and wearing human clothing. Characters have humanity forced onto them just to see how they act, how they react, and how they grow and develop under these circumstances. Will they revert to their animalistic natures and tendencies, or will they mature with a more civilized nature? Most importantly though, will our two main characters bang or not? So many questions, so little amount of episodes for such heavy storytelling. Before we get started though, we at Glass Reflection would like to give a shout out to the sponsor of not just this video, but the whole review week of awesome Surfshark VPN. Do you know what a VPN is yet? If not, you've been missing out on the last three videos that I've done where they've been a sponsor. Why would you do that? Why would you miss my content? How dare you? I'm just kidding. Live your life however you want. I can't tell you what to watch. But Surfshark can potentially help you watch so much more by changing your digital location to that of another country in order to bypass their pesky region locking. Content blocked on services such as Netflix and YouTube can now be accessible simply by connecting to a local server from the country that you'd like to access. Which today is important because Netflix is front and center. When the second season of Beastars comes out, it is possible that they'll give it a stupid long delay before it's available on North American Netflix, despite airing the series on Japanese Netflix at the start of next year. So then you just turn on your VPN, hit Japan, and bing bam boom, watch the show. I've also been told, thankfully, that most Netflix originals contain English subtitles even when it airs in Japan, so you should be fine on that front. Surfshark is also available on mobile devices if you like to stream from your mobile phone or tablet, so why don't you give it a try? If you don't like it within 30 days, let them know and they will get you your money back. No questions asked. There will be a link and a promo code in the description where you can sign up for a percentage off as well as an extra 3 months free, because we like you guys just that much. Thank you so very much to Surfshark for sponsoring. Now, ladies, gentlemen and others, my name is Arcada, and today on Glass Reflection, the 2019 anime from Studio Orange, Beastars. Let's jam. Let's actually start with the portion I think I was originally thinking about and voiding entirely. And that is the comparison between Beastars and, well, Zootopia. Several aspects to Beastars tie in similarly to that of Zootopia. The world in which our characters live seem to almost be somewhat mirror images in many ways, and not just because they both contain societies of anthropomorphic animals that have decided for themselves that the carnivores should just not eat the herbivores. And everyone just seems okay with that. Beastars takes things in a very different direction, just in terms of tone by, well, for one, not being a Disney movie. They're no longer restrained by the idea of, is this family friendly or not? This was designed for Netflix, the platform that had Masaki Yasa go from happy-go-lucky tales about fun-filled nights on the town and mermaids to dark, violence-fueled bloodfests. Oh, we should have our characters talk about how violence is wrong, and that we are all living in a happy society with no problems. Let's instead have a character racked with instinctual bloodlust, who can't seem to differentiate between a desire to consume and a desire to mate. Oh yes, bring the bunny with laced lingerie. Hey kids, if your 
parents taught you about the wolves and the rabbits yet? I mean, seriously, why build a dedicated fan base from scratch when you can just co opt the furry fandom and give them all a reason to toss this on their must watch list for the next decade or so, purely because you actually gave this kind of content the light of day? I am, of course, being needlessly pedantic. The series is not solely about furry bait, though that's the most obvious takeaway for the more reactionary clickbait light synopses that have course come to dominate the internet discourse as of late. No, the series instead takes some well-established assumptions about animal behavior and tries to tie them down to more humanistic things like ego and pride. It does this by placing the story in one of the most overused settings imaginable, a high school, the perfect vessel for a coming of age tale. Not entirely a bad idea. Most high school stories in some way involve characters sorting through their adolescence in different ways. So many bodily changes, so many new hormones to understand, and in some cases attempt to control. So why don't we dial that all the way up to 11 and have the animalistic nature of our characters make everything so much worse for them, to the point where you have to wonder how this society got functioning in the first place. Legoshi is our wolf boy protagonist. By day, he is a silent and stoic member of the school's drama club. When when he does speak, he is soft-spoken, polite, and gentle, almost the polar opposite of the bloodthirsty carnivore that parts of his appearance make him out to be. But by night! Well, actually, nothing happens. He's still the same humble guy, but the night makes it harder for him to ignore his more subconscious desires. What those desires are becomes the main point of Lagoshi's internal conflict. He ends up developing an unusual attraction to the young dwarf rabbit Haru after a particular incident after hours on the school grounds that led him to possibly being one chomp away from ending her life. What he wrestles with as his instincts rage within him is whether he is attracted to her in a romantic and lustful way or just the more logical hunter and prey kind of way. Many characters in Beastars seem to share the similar dual life problems, albeit much more openly, in, in a world where everyone gets along by day, but there are clearly some deeper biological instincts at work, and most characters almost seem like they are living a kind of dual life. One where they feel the need to mask who they are, so that society won't label them as an outcast. For Legoshi, this is particularly stressful, as prior to meeting Haru, he never had any difficulty keeping whatever manner of animalistic nature within himself in check, now being surprised at himself for who he might really be, and what that could mean. But if Legoshi was the only character suffering from this kind of dual life, I would be disappointed in this series, even considering that it's only 12 episodes in length. But thankfully, his struggles are not the only one. Take for example, Luis. His mask is not of a carnivore desperately trying to keep his nature in check for fear of harming someone, no. Instead, despite being a deer and physically weaker than fellow carnivore students, his mask is almost the opposite. He is a guy desperate to avoid showing even a hint of weakness. He never wants to appear as fragile or easily breakable. And he is extremely envious of characters like Legoshi, who are just naturally stronger. And he is disappointed when someone like Legoshi refuses to use his strength. All of these inner and outward desires by the characters are underlined by the scene that starts off the show, when a member of the drama club is murdered and eaten, presumably by a carnivore classmate. It frames the narrative struggles as not just, well, even if I have these desires and tendencies, it's not like I would ever act on them, except, you know, that one time that one of their classmates actually did. Despite being such a focal point at the start, however, the actual murder itself is inconsequential. This is not a mystery series that takes to having a character trying to, to solve it, to uncover who the murderer was. In fact, the, the whole incident largely gets forgotten because after it happens, it has served its purpose. The murder was never the story, but the fact that someone could and did murder did eat a student is absolutely the story. One that sticks in the mind of the entire school for the plot going forward. Now, that's not to say that there's no mystery. There's a decent amount of that. There's intrigue and questioning of motives. It's just that the initial murder gets swept aside in favor of everything far more interesting. That said, the series is also not one to take itself too seriously. An entire episode, for example, is dedicated to a hen character who's 
unfertilized eggs are sold and consumed by her classmates. This is one of those plot lines where after the constant human comparisons of the rest of the series, makes you pause and seriously ask, what the hell is wrong with this show? And need I even mention the fact that when the mangaka appears at events, she actually uses the mask of that hen character. Like, I don't want to draw conclusions, but that's a little weird. <laughs> and again, most Japanese artists who like to keep their face out of the limelight are just like that. Like, look at freaking Yoko Taro. <laughs> But, you know, even with all of that, I almost want to say that at times... I want to say that at times you need to turn your brain off, but that also makes me feel like it's a disservice to the rest of the series. There is a lot of talk and discussion that can be had from the questions posed by Beastars. It's one of the reasons why I think the animal-focused cast was such a great choice. But I also feel like it's easy to dismiss a lot of it as just weird or perhaps... Expect it. Of course a wolf is going to want to eat a rabbit. That's just the natural order of things. But when you bring society into it, suddenly it becomes more of a matter of, should this be the natural order of things? Should the natural order be something different? And if so, what? All of this is told in an adaptation that is absolutely gorgeous. I mentioned at the top of the video that Studio Orange handled this, but also that despite this series looking phenomenal, it is a very different style from their previous work. Land of the Lustrous was a fantastically gorgeous series. It had to be when you consider that the characters were made out of sparkling gems. It was just the nature of that setting that lent itself to the animation, and it made everything well sparkle more than it might have otherwise. Beastars doesn't have that same sparkle, obviously, but its animation is in no way lesser because of it. It's hard for me to really describe, though, as I'm not necessarily an expert in manners of animation, especially not 3D animation, but what I'll say about the work done with Beastars and Orange's portfolio as a whole is that they can take 3D animation and have entire episodes where I have to remind myself that I am looking at something almost completely computer generated. Usually when CG is used in anime, it takes it takes me out of it. Sometimes shows have gotten away with CG backgrounds or cars or miscellaneous other objects in a scene without drawing too much attention to the fact that they are CG, but far more often it's very noticeable and it's very much a blemish when it otherwise could have been different under a different style. Here though, the CG accentuates the story, the characters. It is able to utilize its nature to show us things not necessarily possible with traditional 2D animation, but still grounded in many of the same principles. Studio Orange is a master at this kind of animation, and I cannot wait to see what else they have in store in future, which I will be able to very soon because Beastars' second season airs next month. Not that that might matter, because freaking Netflix. No, seriously, this, this bumps me out. You have this amazing series with great characters, stellar animation, and bar none, the best opening sequence of all 2019 with its stop motion animation and absolute banger of a song. All of that. And Netflix delayed its North American release until 2020. Do you want to know how hard it was to sit there? Not just trying to figure out my own picks, for the best of 2019, but I was a judge for the Crunchyroll Anime Awards, and I had to pretend like I never watched Beastars because Netflix's self-imposed delay made it ineligible for nomination. I suppose the, the bright side is that 2019 was pretty freaking crowded as it was, so the 2020 picks will be quite a bit easier to make, and you can be damn sure I'm not forgetting about this series this time around. Hopefully, I am not the only one. But we'll have to see. Because as much as this series poses interesting questions, it, as of yet, has settled on any of the answers. If this was it, though, if this was the first and only season that we got, I could not, in good conscience, recommend this series anywhere near as highly as I am going to, with the knowledge that a conclusion is just around the corner. Now, as to if that continuation will continue with more questions, I cannot really say. The manga completed its run earlier in the year, so it's not like there is a fear of catching up, and the actual episode count for season two hasn't been confirmed. It might be a 24 2 core season, if we're lucky, but who knows? Also, looking at how many chapters are left to cover, 
there is a good chance we're gonna need at least a season three as well if we want to see everything animated properly. And you know, with the history of anime rarely getting a second season, let alone a third outside of, you know, Shonen and the fact that Netflix also has a history of cutting shows after two seasons because they slowly become unprofitable compared to new ventures, I'm not gonna remain optimistic that they are gonna be able to stick the landing on this one. Beastars is, however, even now, one of the better anime to take place in a school to tackle those ever so common issues of growing up just with a far more sinister and serious side to the results. It had its ups and downs as the narrative continued. It has many different subplots from the unsolved murder to the various love triangles and beyond that should be dealt with. But much of my recommendation comes down to just how unique the show feels, despite having so many elements to it that we've all seen elsewhere. It's all in the presentation, I suppose. And if you are looking for a new anime to binge and only have Netflix as your streaming options, then, well, I know what you should be doing tonight. But that choice is up to you. As such, with all of that in mind, I happily give Beastars the recommendation to watch it. Or buy it, you know, whenever it comes out on physical media, if it does. Now, some might question that because I am recommending it, despite the fact that this as an adaptation is not over, when I just yesterday did not recommend Tower of God for, on the surface, the same thing. Beastars is just so much better, though. It's weird, it's got superb animation, all of the characters have great development for the amount of time that we spent with them. The biggest difference, though, between the two is that had this been the end, if we weren't getting another season, I think I might still be okay with where the first season left off. Disappointed, sure, but still decently satisfied, which is not something I can say about Tower of God. For alternate anime recommendations on this one, I only have one, and the reason for that is because you absolutely need to watch this one, once you're done with Beastars, of course, and that is the aforementioned Land of the Lustrous. It is the anime that completely changed my mind on what CG anime is capable of. It puts Studio Orange on the map, and it's just a joy to watch besides. It too needs a second season desperately, but also, like Beastars, it has enough to make me satisfied with where it left off, only disappointed in the lack of a sequel for the moment. But hopefully, if you watch it, you will find it to your liking. Lastly, a very special thank you to my patrons, who not only support my work in general, but also allow me to do what I do. I love and appreciate you all. Specifically though, as I like to do, I want to give particular shoutouts to patrons Rifen Bonaparte, City Yamako, Wago221, Calhoun Boy, Hector Montemayor, and Rune Jacobson for being especially awesome. You guys are great. And until next time, when there's only one left in this week, watch more anime. And stay frosty.